Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Cool. Okay, so check-ins. Um, yeah, I just feel calm, comfortable, uh, very, very grateful and happy to see my good friend, Andrew. Um, so welcome to the STOA. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA, and this is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And uh, we have a lighter crew today. Um, and so how it's going to work is that it's almost going to be like a podcast format where Andrew and I are just going to riff on the gift economy. And if you have any questions at any time, just write in the chat box. And then when like a thread uh, of ours is kind of um, dies down, then I might tag you in to jump in. So it's like a hot potato with a podcast and you can jump in with your question for Andrew and then you can have a kind of exchange and then I might jump in to get someone else in there. Or it just might be me and Andrew just talking for, for the whole 60 minutes if no one jumps in. So that's sort of the um, how today will work. Uh, I guess that being said, Andrew, do you have any opening thoughts about today's topic or gift economy or just, or just anything? Yeah. Yeah. Would it help if I provide you what a gift economy is? Uh, you, you broke up just a little bit there. Uh, I think I, I heard you say providing with a gift economy. Yeah. Would it would help if I provide a, I would just look at my, <laughs> <laughs> my internet just to see what I was doing. I was like, oh, he's going with there. Uh, <laughs> I was looking around the corner. You can't, I can't see it. Um, would it help if I provide just a two minute overview for people who are not accustomed to? Yeah, I think that's, that's good. Okay. Uh, let me just provide you with a thought experiment. Uh, so it's nice, nice to meet everyone. Uh, it's lovely to see you here today. Hi. Um, let's imagine that we have three entities, uh, A, B, and C. And the entities could be persons or they could be organizations or groups. So let's just be agnostic about what these entities are, A, B, and C. In a gift economy, what could happen is that uh, entity A, here after A, could just out of full hardness give a gift to, to B. B would receive the gift wholeheartedly. So we have, so far we have uh, one act and two wholehearted moves. Now, it's what's key about a gift economy, at least in my experience, having lived in one for about a decade, is that it's B has no burden. There are no debts that are accruing to B just in virtue of having received a gift from A. So B at some later point could give a gift to C, and that would be fine, and then B would give a gift wholeheartedly to C, and C would receive the gift wholeheartedly. Or at some later point, B could give a gift to A, but it's not in any way an exchange. Those are two fundamentally different acts that transpired there. So you might ask yourself, what is, what is actually going on here? Um, Whereas in a market system, you begin with a sense of separation between entities. That sense of separation is perpetuated. In a gift economy, what's happening, if I may put it rather poetically, is that you have in and through the set of actions we call givings and receivings, love emerging. Or if I may put it a little bit less poetically, you get more and more entanglement. So what's actually going on over, and I gave you a few different acts. If you continue to iterate this process, so to speak, what you begin to see is greater and greater entanglement of different entities with one another. So the aim of a gift economy actually is the, you might say rather poetically, the full expression of love. Whereas the aim of market uh, transactions is to maintain separate entities as separate entities. So that's just a little starting point and we can go from there. It's like, like um, the whole thing about how it's uh, uh, your, your, like the, that's love, there's an expression of love, the gift economy. I just want to agree with that and not even, not even fully understanding <laughs> it. <I> like, yes, <laughs> uh, but maybe you can kind of fill in some of the, um, the details or the gaps there, but why is that the case? Uh, let me try to give you a, a, a very concrete example. Um, let, let's suppose someone out of the blue writes to me and, and gives me a gift of money. I, I have no idea who this person is. 
<clears throat> the person is giving the gift in order to support the, the philosophical life I'm leading. And I could just say, thank you, that's that. But that's not really the invitation here. The invitation is for me to write back and say, how are you doing? What's going on with your life? Or thank you so much. Or here's what my life is like. So it ends up being that particular gift ends up being initiation into the ways in which we become more and more entangled. So there's a wonderful quote from um, uh, Martin Salings, who was, a, who was an anthropologist, who wrote a, a fundamental essay in the 1960s or so called The Original Affluent Society. And he says in this essay somewhere, or maybe it was in the other part of the book called Stone Age Economics, if friends give gifts, gifts make friends. And it's a, almost a direct quote from the book. That's a nice instantiation, right? You start to realize that what's happening in and through multiple forms of givings and receivings is that you end up getting what the Greeks would have called philia, uh, an incredible example of loving friendship. Okay, so there's, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with that and it, and it resonates deeply. Um, now there's a couple, there's, there's a few threads to go down and I don't have a good sense of which one to go down. Um, is, is there anything alive for you of, of what to inquire into about the gift economy, like how it can manifest in different areas, how to uh, sophisticatedly, uh, sophisticatedly frame it in order to kind of like, you know, um, engender that love? Because right now I'm just throwing something up on my website, a little blurb, and it doesn't feel sophisticated. And, and your philosophical practice, uh, when you sort of onboard someone into it, uh, you ask them specific questions uh, that help them kind of understand how uh, they can give a gift in, in sort of the right way. Um, so any kind of line of inquiry feels alive for you? I think we should look at some concrete cases. Um, we could look at the store. We have some people on the call who are involved in nonprofits. Um, yeah, that would be that would be great because I know what mine looks like. I've been doing it now for about a decade, so I'm very clear about. But it would be interesting to see what does a gift economy actually look like in cases that are not like the particular life I'm leading. Yeah, that's that's really good. Okay, so a few people just came in. Uh, what we're doing, we're just sort of, me and Andrew are having kind of a conversation, almost like a podcast conversation. But if you're inspired to ask a question, just write in the chat box. And uh, if a thread dies down, I'll take you in and then you can kind of ask Andrew your question. And I think this is the right, right line of inquiry right now. Um, so maybe, maybe you, could, you said this before the last se session you were here at the STOA. Yeah. And the kind of like the, the inspiration of this one, I just want to seek your counsel about you know, like, like personally seek your counsel in such a way that would be beneficial for others in order to how we can kind of use the gift economy idea, the spirit of it and apply it to different kind of domains and aspects. Um, so maybe you can just do like a recap of how you go about your uh, um, gift economy and your philosophical practice. And we can talk about the STOA. Yeah. Um, well, Okay, so there you get to imagine that there are ranges between 20 and 40 people around the world with whom I regularly philosophize. <clears throat> um, and, then, and then you have to imagine that uh, we're not involved in two different sorts of things. One is um, exchange. So it's not the case that the person's coming and thinking that this is a service. <clears throat> and the person is somehow going to get philosophical wisdom uh, in exchange for uh, money or vice versa. So it's not an exchange. It's also not a donation. It would take a while to spell out the difference between what I call a gift and what I call donation. It's not a donation uh, in the sense that it's not, for example, directed at some kind of mission. In this case, the gift is given to me to support my life. So I think that's enough for a starting point. Um, now what happens is that um, I'm basically interested in cultivating a certain kind of philosophical relationship with someone. So let's call that philosophy, just to make it very clear. So we're philosophizing in a certain way. The last time I probably described it by thinking about a certain world that we live in. So the philosophizing is its own thing. Now, because I have a body, and because my wife has a body, 
because the body requires food and other material needs to be met, there's another world which we'll call the gift economy. Uh, the philosophizing which takes place at a regular basis is its own fundamental thing. And the gift economy is something else entirely. The reason I continue to spell it out in this way is that the, the, the typical line of thought is to suggest that two different things can be compared in such a way as to make it seem as if they're equivalent. But the fundamental understanding of a gift economy is that fundamentally different things are fundamentally different. So on a certain basis, I can go into this in more detail, uh, uh, the person will offer a gift to support, and usually in the form of money, to support the life that we're leading. And in aggregate, all of those gifts make up what, call, what I would call livelihood. Then I have questions I ask people at a certain point to make, to make it very clear and plain how we're going to understand money in this relationship. But the most basic question is this, how much are you able to give in a wholehearted way in order to meet some material needs? And that, that can always change over time. That's where it gets a little bit more sophisticated. If the person does well in life and wishes to give more, that's wonderful. If the person is falling on hard times and, and needs to give less, that's also fine. So it's a fluid dynamic motion. And the reason why it's what Nassim Talib would call an anti-fragile system, if you want to get into the, that language, is that there is a sufficient number of people from different places around the world in different industries, all of whom are giving different amounts. <clears throat> so that if one person wishes to leave, that's fine. That's still a sufficiently anti-fragile system. If other people wish to come, that's fine too. So one thing to say that, that speaks in favor of it is that it differs ostensibly from what Nassim Talib would call a fragile system, which is that of gainful employment. And I think I'll kind of conclude my remarks there. So I have, I have um, so I want to get into the weeds of the stoa and how the stoa is using the gift economy and how we can use it better. Um, but first, the the frame I'm using, I'm, I'm viewing uh, the stoa and this project as my gift to the world right now. Do you have that frame too with your philosophical practice? Is that that you viewing that this is your gift you're giving to the world? The, uh, yes and no which is a little bit of a, <laughs> a coy reply. <laughs> yes, and if we go back to the two, let's, let's take the Stoa, for example. So any of these sessions for you, um, you might call that the philosophy world. Uh, so let's say someone comes on, talks about Seneca or about COVID-19 and sense-making. All of that where Adam Robert comes on and talks about, I don't know, uh, spiritual practice for Lena, et cetera, et cetera. All of these I would call philosophy. That is a gift, but you'd be very careful with people because you don't want them to think that the gift of philosophy is comparable to the gift uh, that comes in the form of money or help or whatever. Yeah. That's why I tend to be very, I don't tend to use the gift to the world quite as frequently anymore because I get a little bit concerned that people start to think, oh, if you give a gift to the world, then I need to give you a gift or something yes. like that. Yeah. So I usually say that philosophy is about wisdom and understanding. That's why I use this two world dualistic analogy yeah and that the other one's about the gift which helps to meet the material needs of the body That's or that you can say it's a gift that, that, that meets the material needs of the stoa if you yeah because a part of me just wants to give this whatever i'm doing right here without like receiving anything i just want to do this uh, the stoa project um no <laughs> i mean what i one thing i learned is that people today particularly in spiritual circles talk about having no expectations Mm -hmm. We've heard that a lot, but that's not really true. I thought about that before our, 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 uh, this, this session today. It's not that you need to have no expectations. It's that you need to begin to examine the expectations you have and have fewer expectations. One expectation I have for everyone with whom I philosophize is that they give something. Because I've actually tried uh, in, in, in my life, uh, I, I've actually tried to uh, philosophize with people and they don't, uh, and there's no uh, expectation they would ever give. Right. It doesn't, honestly, I mean, this is not some kind of neoliberal argument. It's just, <laughs> it, yeah. it's just, it, there needs to be, a, typically there needs to be a little bit of skin in the game. Someone right. says, thank you. And that's it. You know, to, to, yeah, to qualify my, my last statement, it wasn't necessarily tied to the gift economy. It's just sort of like this whole project to me is sort of like reading a really good book. And I don't care if anyone knows I'm reading that book. Right. I just have that desire to do it. Of course. Yeah. 
Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so the Stoll project, maybe I'll give some, I don't know if uh, I mentioned this to you already. Uh, so the idea here is this is like a digital campfire where we have kind of like a wisdom gym that's forming. There's a psycho, like a, a psychotechnology incubator that people can test out things and that can be poured into the wisdom gym. And then uh, there's like sense making nodes where people come in and speak like Jordan Hall, yourself or whoever. And then they have like these Q&A portions. So that's how it's like forming right now. And then people have been offering uh, or inspired to provide gifts uh, just based off the link and just mentioning it in the form of money, help, whatnot. Um, but there has not been sophisticated framing around it like you have in your practice, which I'm hoping we can get to. Uh, but that was, what's interesting that's happening here, already two uh, digital campfires emerged from this project. Uh, Colin Morris is the, who I think you, you've talked to or are talking to. Uh, he has a digital dance studio about embodiment and he's basing it off the gift economy. Tyson, who's in this uh, uh, chat right now, he's, he's doing a freestyle uh, uh, studio where it's like freestyle rap in the form of kind of like keeping ego in check and as a form of like, you know, uh, being practicing your truthfulness muscle in a, in a kind of artistic way. And so he started his own digital uh, campfire based off the gift economy model. And so this sort of thing is, is inspiring others, people to do similar things. And so if we can kind of get it right here at the STOA, then it would help other people get it right other places as well, which is, I find really cool. And uh, Raven is in the aud audience as well, and she's probably gonna do her own thing as, uh, with that, uh, with the gift economy as well. So that being said, is there any, before I kind of like ask you about how to make it more sophisticated, the framing and everything, any kind of thoughts on how the STOA could or currently is operating on the gift economy? Yeah, I was thinking about this before our, our session today, and I, I, I found, and I think I may have said this during the last um, gift economy session, that you have to be really clear about the question you ask uh, people, or the, or if you prefer, the invitation you make. Right now, the invitation, I think, is, is too vague. Uh, so the, the vagueness of the invitation will be manifested in, often in the vagueness of the responses or non-responses. Uh, if I if I ask if I if I just ask a question, um, uh, can you give something? Just uh, people people some would say yes, some would say no. It wouldn't be clear what they would give and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I like to think about when I philosophize with people. Um, so one of the criteria is to, is to provide an answer that's very plain and clear, uh, and and just answer that question. So if I ask someone how old he or she is that person would just need to give the age. That's it. That's the answer to that question. Yeah. If I ask the person, uh, what sorts of things do you remember from yesterday? That's a little bit of a vaguer question. It's going to provide a little bit baggier of an answer. If I ask the person, what's the meaning of life? I would expect that answer to be broader, more abstract, less concise, and so on. Uh, what I'm trying to illustrate is that right now, the what, what, I, what I notice, uh, is that a lot of um, the non-profits seem to have very unclear articulations of what they're asking from people. Okay. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I went to the Garrison Institute, which is in upstate New York in the fall, where I was at a, a retreat with a spiritual teacher named Rupert Spira, who's in the Advaita Vedanta direct path tradition for those who are interested. And uh, as you might imagine, the Garrison Institute and other such places that have largely been these in-person retreats have been struggling mightily uh, during COVID-19. So they've, they've pivoted to a virtual sanctuary and they've, they recently, just this morning, were asking for donations. And again, I argued that donations are slightly different from gifts, but it was, it was, and it was someone who was very, I think, uh, has been in this space for a while, but it still felt as if something was missing. For example, I've only been there once is it really going to be the case that I'm likely to be someone who's going to contribute a donation to support this organization? The answer is probably not. So something is going, so something is going awry there when you just have uh, uh, a, a, right, a vague invitation sent out to your listserv with a view to getting some, some people to offer donations. It feels as though there was an opportunity that was missed that, that it lacked the fine grained right. uh, the fine grained nature of asking a good question of someone who might be interested in giving a gift. Yeah. So what, what's coming up is a desire to say kind of like um, what I want, I guess. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. um, and then we can maybe tease out some questions. So 
it's basically I want what you want or what you have, but in a different context. Um, so I want to continue doing what feels like a felt sense level is, is doing something that I want to do for its own sake by doing the store or whatever, whatever's happening right here. And I like the idea if I could be doing this while uh, having my livelihood supported. Um, just like you, you know, you, uh, you support your, yourself, you support your beautiful wife, Alexandra, you have a house. Um, that's beautiful. And then you're doing what I, what seems to me is your uh, greatest gift to the world. You're giving that. Um, and so I, I want just to support my livelihood. I don't need to be greedy. It would be good to have some little bit money in the bank to, for a rainy day type thing like that. I want to live in a small town with Camille. Uh, or a monastery, we might move to the monastic academy. Uh, we got invited to, to stay there. Um, so something like that would be quite beautiful. Um, and as you know, you've been kind of advising me on like the framing of the gift economy, at least that little blurb, like and then my, my spiel at the end where I say, if you want to give a gift in return, you're like, no, 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 cut that shit out, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it makes 100%. Um, and then there's a part of me when I kind of, this is why I'm just like waiting to think about this with, to talk to you, because I, I haven't really been thinking about this much, to be honest. And I know because there's so much other shit going on. Um, but there's like a dirtiness too, it feels like, kind of being um, more clear on this. It's almost like I feel like one of those, uh, those I don't know, those cam girls who have like an Amazon wish list. Like if I mean like a, you know, a skateboard or something like that, like <laughs> if I'm being, being, being too clear with it. Um, but I like the idea, this just came to mind when you're talking, just maybe having it on the gift economy webpage at the stoa having clear like baby basically stating what kind of life i want or what kind of like you know livelihood i need or whatever and then having questions that could help people uh inform them on what gifts to give yes <laughs> yeah people you, you, it's it's not it's not dirty people want to know i'll give you an example that might illustrate uh the the difficulty of being in this space uh, if you ever go to um, a Buddhist retreat or some other place, sometimes there's talk about dana, which is the Buddhist term for generosity or, or mm -hmm. gift. And uh, in some places, such as the Goenka of Apostana retreat, there is no, it's very clumsy how they have it set it up, given that I've been in, uh, thinking about this for a while. But they'll basically say, um, uh, there are a few things that are mistaken, but the one is just give, give out of dana um, based on how much you've benefited. It's like, oh, no, no, that's, 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 that's egoistic. So that, that's not the right criterion. But even if you, if you grant that, you still don't know at the end of 10 day retreat, you have nothing to, you don't know what the organization needs. You don't, you have no, you have no way to kind of set some kind of coordinates or guidelines. Even if you, even if you wanted to give, which is pretty reasonable after 10 days of receiving, um, throughout the court, uh, in a beautiful retreat, you're just not, you're not at all clear. And the unclarity reveals itself in the fact that you don't really know what an appropriate response is. Mm -hmm. So I've basically been in that situation a number of times. I know that people um, I've spoken with have been in that situation a number of times. And it's very refreshing, therefore, to have some clarity. Oh, you need shoes. Okay, well, I think I can provide shoes. Here are some shoes. Oh, you need firewood. You're living in rural Appalachia. Okay, well, I would love to provide you with firewood. I can see how that would function or fill out your life. So I think we need to turn it around and say that it's, it's not being kind of gross or, 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 or weird to, to, to be specific with people. Yeah, if, yeah. If, 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 someone wants to be, if someone wants to be generous, then someone wants to know that there's a form in which that generosity can manifest itself. And then it's going to be wholeheartedly received. If I just give something vaguely to you, or if I give something out of some abstract sense, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you're going to really, it's going to land. Yeah, I like that. That's the expectation of giving. You know, we know what this is like, to give you a simple example. When we have um, birthdays and your parents give you gifts, and you realize the extent to which they don't understand you. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? There's a certain yeah. sense which I, you didn't see what it was that I really needed here. I think you and I both have a history of receiving it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, and when I kind of called that out too, kind of that feeling of, of dirtiness I had, and then just articulating a potential avenue or a way to move forward, it just disappeared too. So um, I think as a next steps, just sort of like uh, having maybe, what do you think about this? So, and maybe you could review the draft. Um, like I create like a, like a blurb of like what, as of this moment, what kind of life I would like 
or kind of you know how I would like uh, my livelihood to be supported and what what I, I kind of require for that and then just kind of ask some uh, questions like wisely uh, designed questions in order to inform people how to provide a gift and then the actual means of how to provide it either PayPal or whatever or help or support yeah and then I would say uh, that's good and then I have kind of two replies to that. one is it's always it's almost always wise not to put too many questions on there the question is really meant to be it's very it's a very niche and it kind of it channels the dionysian energy into a form into an apollonian form right so if you have 20 questions it shows a kind of anxiety you don't i don't want that it's just a, a few nice questions helps to tr direct people's attention to what really matters yes um, yes and it's also coming up to mind is um there's, I'm part of the Stoic Fellowship. There's a nonprofit that kind of organizes all the Stoic groups in the world. And uh, there was tension there between me and them uh, when I launched the Stoic Project. Because they thought, like, was well, this guy directed with the profit motive? Is he, like, just trying to be a hustler and stuff? And so there was, like, a, a disconnect there. But I, I chatted with one of the board members because I'm on the board. Uh, uh, I'm on the board as well. And we chatted and we kind of level set it. Um, and it's interesting. I think it's important to be clear about all that up front. Um, with kind of like humility because it will disabuse people of having these ideas that you're, you're doing something that you're actually not doing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So yeah, I'll send you that when I have that ready. Um, and then maybe we can kind of pivot to uh, the group. Now we have 30 minutes left. Cool. Since we only have 12 people, uh, there's two things, ways we can do it. We can just have like open popcorn style. Anyone can just unmute themselves. We'll trust your discernment uh, or we can do the, Q and A in the chat box. Um, which is your sense, Andrew, for for this? Let's allow people to use the discernment. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go on grid view, and then anyone who feels, uh, I think everyone has the ability to unmute themselves. Yes, you do. So if you feel called to just unmute yourself, just to ask anything to Andrew or even me or just to the group, uh, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Um, so, Peter, um, is this your sort of main source of income, or is, is this um, a side project for you? Like, what what's your situation with running this? Because uh, I'm just wondering um, when you're saying supporting your lifestyle and your income, right. um, what degree is um, are you relying on this to sort of help you along? Yeah. So my, my so. I'm, I'm a trainer at Dale Carnegie Training. Uh, so yep. It's like an interpersonal kind of training company that's been around for 100 years. And uh, they're probably going to go out of business because all their bread and butter is in-person training. Uh, so I'm not doing any training right now. And uh, my wife works full-time remotely. So we're not, we're not, we have a bunch of cash and savings. Uh, so I'm not worried about that. And so there's an option. There's a fork in the road. Do I find like uh, some normie job, you know, like that, that can be awoke from remote or am I going to go full throttle with this thing? And I decided to go full throttle with this thing, uh, maybe about a month ago, or I didn't even have a choice really. I'm just following the day one. I'm just going for it. And, yeah. uh, and people have been gifting, uh, me money, not enough to support a livelihood, but it's substantial. Um, and it's allowing me to buy things to support the project and whatnot. So I think I'm going to make a run for this and I want to do what Andrew does with his philosophical practice. I want to support my livelihood and ideally Camille's livelihood, my wife, on the gift economy. Okay, yeah, because uh, um, I've, I've read some of your blog posts and I've read a little bit about the store background. Um, this is only like my third session, so I, I don't really know where you're coming from financially and also, uh, I guess, the philosophical ethos that you're trying to run the whole project with um, so far. Um, because both those things, I think, and what you've just said, really are going to change how you have to word um i mean i personally wouldn't use the term gift economy but i understand why it is used um the way that you approach people for money um i mean i, I myself um i well i'm now a student but i have been producing music for about five or six years um and and djing and i've made like zero dollars from it um because i've just viewed that as a project of passion but i'm not having to support a wife um and um 
I'm not having to, I'm not in your situation, so it is a bit different. Uh, the questions I think um, Andrew was saying about um, asking people at the end saying, um, like, if you have something like, do you feel you enjoy what we're doing here at the Stella Project? Um, maybe consider giving a gift. That's like stage one of um, asking for maybe arms. And stage two, you start asking them more specific questions like, would you like to continue um, learning with us? Um, it would really help us out and help my life out if you could um, consider donating. Um, be more concrete about using the word donate rather than gift or something more vague. That makes sense. I, I wanna. I'll say something. I wanna bounce it to Andrew. I'm curious. I think he has more wisdom here than I do. Um, like one thing that there's. I'm in a lucky, grateful position. I'm not like stressed to get money or support a livelihood. My wife makes pretty good money. And again, I could I could jump back into the old game A uh, world right now if I wanted to with a little bit of a hustle, but I don't want to. Um, and I also can seek out probably investors for this project at this point. I know a lot of rich people who are digging this project. Um, I'm friends with Nancy Strickler, from, uh, who co-founder of Kickstarter, and I probably can seek his wisdom on how to get investor, investors for this. And he's probably gonna be in the wisdom gym as well. But I don't wanna go down that path yet. And I can bring a lot of attention to this project. I go on a fucking podcast circuit, got all this no egoic noise coming this way, but I don't want that yet either. Uh, yeah. I really resonate with what Andrew's doing and it feels pure. And so I wanna run with that, at least for the time being. So that being said, I'll pass it over to Andrew to see if he has anything to add here. Okay. Um, so it would take a little while to parse a lot of these terms, but let's come back to the first phrasing. Um, if you enjoy what's going on here, consider giving uh, or donating. So that <clears throat> that's not quite the, that, that would be in the spirit of a donation, you might say, but not in the spirit of a gift. Um, the reason is that it doesn't, I tried to give an example last time. Let's take the example of a church. Let's suppose that you're a member of a church. If you're a member of a church, it doesn't really matter, so to speak, whether you enjoy or not enjoy the church on any given occasion. You're committed to being a member of that church. And it doesn't really matter in, in, in a great sense whether the, the sermon was very good on that day. It'd be nice if it were good, but it might not have been that good. You're giving, you're giving, I'm gonna use the word gift here. You're giving a gift, a certain amount, might be a tithe, in order that the church will continue on for the sake of the other congregants and for the sake of future congregants. That's the key to that particular understanding of, of giving a gift there. Yeah. So usually a donation might arise out of having received something and then it's often pointed at, let's say, a cause. Let's say you want to stop malaria in a certain area of Africa. But the, the, the gift, the reason I, I use the term is that it's a little bit, that there's a little bit more play in it, comes out of the, the feeling of gratitude, which is then transmogrified into an act for the sake of the other, be it Peter or the Stoa, be it a person or the church. Yeah. So would you not um, say that the Stoa is a cause though, in that you could say it is a cause to further human knowledge and um, further a sense of community of intellectuals and people who like to think and connect? Or is, is when you say cause, are you saying something that's much more definitional? So let's let's come back just 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 for a moment. Um, <clears throat> let's remember what it's like to. Um, it's very hard at this point in modernity because most of civil society has been eviscerated. So it's, it's really hard to recall what it's like to be a part of some kind of group to which you belong and from which you receive. Let's imagine that um, you belong to a choir group. That's another, <laughs> see where my background is. 
uh, and let's suppose the choir group somehow needs to be supported in an ongoing way. It's not, it's not really the case that there's a cause. It's just the case that there is something that you all love to do for its own sake, to it singing or the beauty of singing together. Yeah. I'm trying to give a sense of what it's actually like to support something, which is what Alistair McIntyre would call um, um, kind of an inner telos. There's, it exists for its own sake, for, for the sake of those who come to it, but not for the sake of something else. If anything comes from the stoa, then it comes as a kind of epiphenomenon or a byproduct or something else entirely. My hunch, and I've, I've, I've not been to every Stoa event in the way that obviously Peter has, is that people are coming to this uh, over and over again, if they are, for the sake of something they can't put their words on, but for the sake of something that is definitely here. They feel as though they're in the right place. It's a bit like finding your, your tribe or finding your scene. That, then the gift comes to support having found mm -hmm. that scene and so that other people can also enjoy it and appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I just want to add to that. Um, yeah, I feel really uncomfortable to instrumentalize this whole project to one cause or some kind of propositional statement of a cause because I'm trying to figure out what this is about myself uh, and, and I'm drawn to it and I think other people are drawn to it as well. I, I, I'd love to, oh, yeah. sorry. I just, I, I'd love to just chime in on just something because uh, I love this conversation and I'm hearing this the various distinctions and how to see this and different lenses and i don't think there is a right answer right now when there's a discovery process here and you know one of the things that you brought up around church um, is that while i might be tithing to the church i do get to choose which church i tithe to so if the sermon over three week period just starts like not touching my soul I may decide, okay, I'm going to continue to tithe, but not the church. I'm going to tithe a different church specifically. So there is some aspect of that donation being, being, or it's being a donation that's directed towards a specific cause. The cause that I'm directing it towards is bringing people together on Sunday and rippling out the most love to the world, you know, and to that community. I think in terms of gift, I often find that like, is a cause a human being or is a human being, it's like, wow, this person, I'm inspired by the way you be and the way that you live. And I'd like to gift you this because I wanna see you continue to succeed in all the ways that you do. It's not a cause towards the animal yeah. rights thing that you're doing, or it's not, a, it's not your music. You're kind of doing a little bit of everything. You're philosophizing, you're Facebook living, you're an influencer, you're doing all sorts of stuff. I wanna gift you in that way. So those are some of the lenses that I'm seeing it through. Again, no, uh, no convincing one way or another, so. Rod, uh, yeah, I just wanna jump in. Um, uh, I was mentioned, me and Tyson are privately mentioning each other and then I Googled you and it looks like you, 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 you're involved in something called the gift economy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? I'm very curious. <laughs> and, and I, I wanted to first listen more here before I started giving new and you know new right. inputs of information. Um, but the, but since you're asking, um, so I do have uh, gifteconomy.com, um, a platform that I'm intending on using that as a educational uh, hub and various you know a platform that brings this conversation together. So articles videos that might come from the zoom chat might come onto that platform or to that website and then gift karma is the name that i've come up with for an app that essentially takes the concept that we're talking about and and then gamifies this process uh uses you know creates a reputation score on the platform not just for uh the net gifts that you give but like how many gifts did you give how many did you receive you know, publicizing that reputation or privatizing it, um, kind of like a social scoring score or social scoring system like China does, except instead of the government doing it to us, we're creating that social scoring system with the gamified actions that we're taking in terms of giving and receiving on the platform. So that's kind of the high level in a nutshell. And, and the idea is gift economy becomes this platform that has a series of apps and content 
that essentially ushers in a new culture of giving on this planet, not as a replacement to the current currency, but more as a supplement, an alternative, and eventually, you know, it could be that it 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 becomes the leading leading force over time, but not necessarily saying money's bad, money's evil. Let's build this. It's acknowledging the layer of the seven layer cake that money does, you know, uh, occupy, and still recognizing that there's more layers um, to our to the way that we uh, resource, you know, and and collaborate and cooperate. Cool. And how'd you find yourself uh, in, in this discussion? Like, how'd you find your way here? Um, Tyson, Mr. Tyson Flows uh, is, is a friend and uh, we have a ton of mutual friends as well uh, in Daniel Eisenman and um, Mystic Misfits and different people. So, um, so I, I got into this conversation. He knows I'd given a talk about the gift economy a few years ago at a, at a conference or mm -hmm. at a, yeah, like a retreat that we were at. And so he knows that I'm, I've been pushing this concept a lot and I'll, 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 I'll finish in just the next 30 seconds, which is <clears throat> I've gone back and forth in terms of like, what are my motivations to doing gift economy and why am I doing it? And, and there is an aspect of it where I'm just like, I'm sick and tired of the money system and I want to build this fucking system that changes the game. And what I'm finding though, whenever I have that mindset, it's like, wait, hold on. Like, let me first get my solidified systems, at least at some level on the, in the muggle world and the current paradigm economics. And let me really show up to the gift economy conversation and this effort from an empowered space and not from a place of neediness. And so not trying to fill that void with this platform, but more so see my efforts in the gift economy as a gift. Like I'm here as a gift or as somebody that's giving forward to society and to the, uh, you know, creating of a new, a whole new beautiful world as Charles Eisenstein Stein would say, you know, so that's, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Cool. That's, I'm glad you're here. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having this conversation. Andrew, was anything alive for you? Uh, I was I was just listening. I was just really appreciative yeah. of, of what was being said. Thank can, you. I, can I throw out something uh, for Andrew? Um, and I'm just wondering how you think of the so-called trading economy, which I also hear about, where people want to just trade specific trade transactions versus the gift economy. Um, and as just an, as an example, I'm a coach later in life, having been an attorney earlier in life. And there, you know, there's a lot of that that goes on in those worlds where there's a, I'll trade you this service for that service. And maybe people are even looking at, I'll trade you coaching for vegetables or, you know, uh, other materials like that. That's more of a spe specific transaction. So I don't, I'm guessing you don't think of that as so much, uh, a gift as you use it. And then there's also the issue in something like coaching, as you know, where there's a downside to being pro bono because there's no skin in the game. So that adds another uh, dimension. So do you, do you look at the idea of trade specific trading is just totally different than the gift economy or maybe a subset? Yeah, I have. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a transition case. Uh, so I, so I, I typically frame things in the following way. If you ask yourself how human beings or homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens ended up surviving, I, I've only think, seen three basic models. One, uh, we've lived off the land in various ways. So you can think of hunters and gatherers, and then you can also think of the invention of agriculture around 10 to 12,000 years ago. And you can think of a, a, a American poet, Wendell Berry, as someone who's argued that we need to return to land and live off of it in a humble, kindly manner. That's one. The second one is uh, the, the invention and utilization of markets, specifically in the form of transactions, trades, or exchanges. The third one is, is the hard one to describe. It's, 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 it's the notion, I call it the gift. Um, so typically what happens with people is that they, as they begin to question, let's say the ubiquity of the market system, they begin to uh, cast about and they look for some alternatives. And the first alternative seems to be barter or trade. It's not bad, 
it, it's not bad in the sense that a coaching, you know, I, I have one person I speak with who tra trades coaching sessions for yoga sessions. That, that's fine. But it's a good transition case. It does suggest that there's something that I can offer and something that you can offer, and we won't, we won't mediate it through the use of money. Well, that's fine. But I don't think it quite goes far enough because really what you care about is being with that person. Now, let's just make it clear, right? You, it, it, if, if you're offering a coaching session and that person is offering in turn yoga session, really what you're doing, okay, I'll, I'll give you an example from a friend of mine. He's in his 60s. He says that what men tend to, by the way, this is a, he's an older man, so this is kind of what men tend to do, sort of statement. He says what men tend to do is that they mediate the relationship through some kind of thing. They can't just talk to one another. They have to watch football and kind of look over and chat, or they have to play some kind of sport. Uh, and while they're, while they're tossing the football back and forth, they talk about something seriously. I think what's happening here with this, this notion of trade or barter with, with regard to certain relationships is that there's not yet the foregrounding of the relationship. What, gift, what, what giving, in the sense I use it, tends to do is it, it finally foregrounds the relationship that you care about. You finally realize that that's what's substantively at stake here. And so the gift is the gift is sort of the secondary part that helps to mediate the and, and so to speak lubricate the relationship. Um, and, and I think we notice a difference if someone comes over and, um, and and out of the blue gives you a gift. It feels so heartwarming, and you don't expect anything from it. Let's just remember that experience. And gives you a gift out of the blue, and it's, it's so heartwarming. It's so lovely. Can I speak to that? Um, it's two points there. Um, I'll put my first, well, my second point first. Um, what you were saying about heartwarming gift. Um, so I just recently did that for my best friend. Um, he's sort of been in dire straits recently, had suicidal ideation and sort of had a suicide attempt and has had quite bad depression. Um, and I had told him, um, you probably all know the show Mr. Rogers Neighborhood or have um, heard of it in the past. And I told him about uh, Mr. Rogers and sort of just the, the simple kindness that he showed. And um, I had a phone call with him and I sung him the song, It's You I Like, um, because I know who, he, I knew he was in that sort of mindset where he needed someone to show him or even gift him care. And at the end of, I think it was the morning after, I said, hey, give me your address, mate. Went onto Amazon and I ordered him a book of Mr. Rogers quotes. And I said, this is my gift to you. Put this on the side of your bed. And anytime you feel sad or you don't feel cared for, just flip to a page and think of me. And that's my gift to you is just my um, unconditional care and love. And that is um, just what I wanted to speak on, on what you, your, uh, your last point was, that, that um, when we're given a gift like that, out of the blue and without any um, need for reciprocation or wanting a return, um, it positively enlightens our soul. Yeah, I think that's very beautiful. Thank you. That was very heartwarming. I mean, that, that nails it. That's that. I hope that everyone heard that because that's really the spirit of a gift. It's, 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 it's exactly right. And, um, and then, uh, then there's non-attachment, so you can't keep telling the story yeah. 10 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> you, kind of let, had, you have to let go of it so that there is an ego attachment, but it's, it's a very, I, I had very a, beautiful story. A second point as well. So we, uh, in the form of a gift, um, uh, who was Ron was saying he um, he was uh, doing like a quid pro pro of co coaching for another service, and now uh, service for service is sort of a little bit different. Um, I I don't have a job currently, so I do try to give money when I can, and um, but with me, I have quite a lot of um, skills in my repertoire, and what I like to do if is. is when I see there's a project or a person or um, an idea that I fully support and I want to see flourish is that I'll approach that person and I'll offer my skills or offer to collaborate with them 
in the form of what I term as a gift um, to help the project um, move on or improve or it, like uh, I've been writing for about six years so um, I'll say hey if you just need some like promo posts or if you need me to help um, proofread or edit or something we'll do it for free um, because I believe in this project and I want to see, see it uh, move forward. Would you say that is part of the gift economy or is that still sort of like a marketable type thing in a sense? I think it's the, the case is probably not thick enough, but I mean, to, to discern, but uh, let's suppose that uh, you saw something that you really cared about, right? as seems to be the case. Let's suppose also that you were clear about uh, the extent of your commitment. Otherwise, it'll, it'll turn into a volunteer position of some kind. So you, you're, free, you're clear that it's rather scoped, so to say. And you're clear that you're really looking for nothing in return. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not, so to speak, like some kind of Weasley internship or something like that. Uh, then, then it looks like a gift. Um, now, usually what happens here is that people will have alternative, I mean, the, the really interesting part of the point of spiritual practice is that you have to very much investigate your intentions. Because if it comes to pass that what you're really doing is uh, you're, you, you, you say it's a gift, but in truth, you're at the art gallery. This is before COVID-19, so that you could be an intern, so that you become fully hired and so forth, then it's fine. It's certainly a, a networking strategy, but that's no longer a gift. That's just a, a right? It's a, it's, a, it's a way to get yourself gainfully employed. Yeah, I, and I, I also think, um, not so much with gifts, but with Western altruism, um, th there's a sense that there's a lot of people who practice altruism now, but not for the, uh, the sole cause of altruism, of compassion and empathy. What they're doing is they're practicing altruism, say giving um, money to a homeless person, because they want that response of, I've done something good, I've done my part. Um, and they just, they want a, a dopamine response, but they're not doing it just out of kindness and compassion. Um, they're wanting something out of it. Um, and it, it, it is really something that happens in Western cultures. Um, in Eastern cultures, like uh, in Thailand, um, there's uh, Buddhist arms, um, which is, uh, it, it's not a reciprocation, it's a, um, communal type thing um and uh, i don't really know too much about uh so-called gift economies in um eastern cultures other than that but um th that there's an example for uh, contrast right so the the important point here and i know we have about five minutes left so i'm gonna open it up for anyone else so i'll make this brief is that one reason i like it Mm -hmm. this alternative economy, which we've been calling a gift economy, is that it actually does require a purification of your intentions. So you need to know that you're giving a gift not out of guilt, not out of egotism, but really out of loving kindness. So in Buddhism, it would be called metta. I give this for the sake of the other. And in and, and, and Aristotle, there's something similar. He talks about true friendship in terms of what I called philia, that is, I care for this person for his or her own sake. So that's, that's the kind of the essence of the practice is to learn that. But I'm aware that we have just about four minutes left. So is there yeah. anyone else who would like to offer something? So I uh, just, uh, just jump in. Um, Andrew, are you, are you have to go right at the hour. Could you stay maybe like five, 10 minutes after just to feel yeah, one yeah, question? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So anyone who hasn't spoken yet, um, and if you have something, uh, feel free to just jump off mute. Yeah. You have your hand up, uh, Gene. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if you can think back in, you know, prehistory, as it were, uh, for both uh, Peter and Andrew, uh, was the gift response perhaps the, the origins, the genesis of, uh, of all our economies? Uh, you know, can you imagine perhaps in a, in a tribal setting of uh, prehistoric uh, humans, um, just simply one person giving a gift to another, and that led gradually to the, the uh, trading of the market economies and everything that we have now. Uh, then a second thing I uh, just thought we could riff on a little bit is if, if it's something in, in a negative context that would be considered by most of society to be a negative, 
for example, if somebody wanted to give a gift to the NRA or to the uh, white supremacy movement or something like that, um, how should we treat that as, uh, in the overall society? Uh, do we all have free will to gift whatever we want? Or, or is it, um, uh, should there be some, I don't know, moral constraints about, about all that? Can I throw that out? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at those hard questions. <laughs> Unless you want to, Peter. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> all right, so the first one. Uh, I'm not enough of a historian of anthropology to be able to quite answer it, but I can, I can, I can venture a hunch, and let's just call it a hunch. The hunch would be that within a tribe, you can have, in some tribes, the circulation of gifts. So if you want to, I can point you to some literature on that. So this is within the tribe circulation of gifts on the assumption that uh, at a certain level of um, development in a hunter gatherer tribe, you're going to have the dispersal of gifts according to the needs of this particular ensemble. That's probably true. I think you usually begin to notice and, and uh, anthropologists and historians of economics will, will correct me if I'm wrong, that, that, that uh, trading occurs between tribes. So this is what's really interesting. I think we still have that, that, that intuition. This is what I've written about in the recent years. The intuition is that to, to your friends, in the substantive sense, you give gifts. To those who are strangers, you transact. We still have that intuition. This is why it seems strange to us. This is why PayPal is a completely anomalous, uh, right? Neologism, because you don't pay your pals. You would never pay your pals, <laughs> right? You give gifts to your pals. <laughs> <laughs> it's also why the sharing economy is anomalous too. It's not a sharing economy. That's just game A in a different form. Uh, Airbnb was, BNB was never a sharing economy. It was always just a, a, a hospitality industry. We, we, real, we feel that in our sense that if you're really going to share something with someone, that looks as though it's a relationship of friendliness or friendship. If you're going to exchange with someone, that looks as though it's someone with whom you don't want to have a friendship. It's a stranger whom you trust in a very minimal sense. So that's, that's my first take. Um, the second one, uh, I'm not really sure how to answer the question about whether or not we should limit gifts given to say the NRA. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I've never really thought about that very much. Um, I guess the question would be if, if you, uh, Granting the granting the existence of this entity, would it be the case that gifts would be such as to make it so powerful as to be hegemonic or dominant in that society? That's the best I can do at this point. <laughs> that is to say, if you were to allow for gifts to be given to the point at which the NRA becomes so huge, became so huge, that gun ownership became so great that um, the effects of gun ownership were so bad for Americans. Which it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> Which it probably is, but <laughs> that's the best I can say. I, I, I'm not really sure. Um, but thank you for your questions. I love just, just to speak into this. You know, if I have a customer that comes to my store and I, I know that he has a history of stealing, you know, do I say, sorry, no shirt, no shoes, no stealers, you know, no service, you know, like, do I, is it, on me to stop that transaction or that interaction with him because I'm not, because I judge his actions to be out of alignment with my moral value code. And I've wrestled with that. And the truth is, is that we're connected to every person anyways. And it's not my decision or my choice to say if I'm gonna do that. If I want to, I will, but not from a should place, but from a desire. Do I want to interact with this person or not? And I think that having the should or the rules around it for ourselves or for others, I think we can just speak to it that like, hey, when we're gifting, we are putting energy into something. We are watering that plant. And if that plant is a weed, then that weed's going to get bigger. And so it's just part of the knowledge that we go into it with that awareness. So that's, that's like one point I want to share. And then as far as the second point with, with Andre talking about, like, it's a, it's a bridge. Uh, I, I, wait, I'm not sure. Sorry, I don't remember who started this. But in terms of giving, like, if you're giving because you want to get the recognition that you're this 
generous person. Well, that's okay. That could be a bridge because you might do it for the external validation and the ego and your wife is going to, you know, think you're hot stuff because you gave, you know, you're giving and you're such an amazing macho guy that's helping the world. And then after that, you get the return on investment of the ripple of impact report from that gift. And you find out that, oh my God, all these kids were fed, all these people, and your heart opens up. So potentially you might've done it for the egoic. You might've done it because you wanted to get laid. You might've done it for all the reasons. I, I can tell you because I've done it for all the reasons myself. So I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about myself. And, but then after a while, by putting myself in that situation and there's a little kid there that's smiling and, you know, and I'm tearing up because I'm remembering when I was a kid, my heart opens up and this essentially supported me getting there which is why I've been thinking that this gift economy movement is a combination of education, conversation, like we're doing here, and also tools and platforms that help train somebody, kind of like the Health app or Fitbit or something where people run more with Fitbit, not because the Fitbit actually makes you run more, but because you like seeing that score go up. You're doing it for the scoring reason. You're doing it for the seemingly wrong reasons. But then you're like, shit, I look good. You know, I don't, who fucked the Fitbit? I'm just going to keep running because I feel good in my body. And so the Fitbit was serving as a effective bridge. I have a question to surface. And my curiosity is around like, if I have a gift that I am interested in giving because I love to give it. So gathering people around a freestyle campfire, giving a gift of inexperience. And how, yeah, I want to be in right relationship with the parts of me that want to market and promote and brand because I think then there will be a, you know, because I want to receive gifts as well. And I think that, uh, and I want a lot of people to come to these experiences, but I notice myself, yeah, like wanting to proceed with caution in a way. I don't want to bring, I want to be wise about what game A things I've taken on that I bring into this relationship and what I completely leave behind. Um, so I'm just curious about any thoughts about how to be in right relationship with that. Right. Uh, I just want to double click and support that comment because that's uh, uh, a challenge that I find with the whole Stola project of like, like I could market it more aggressively, but I'm not because I, I like the slow build of, of attracting the right people. Uh, I don't think we have uh, the sort of the, the ability to transmute noise into signal right now or, or kind of keep ego in check if too much ego comes in too fast. So I'm really curious what Andrew, um, cause I know, remember you had a, a few. I'm not really sure what the question is exactly. Um, if I were to rephrase it, it's like Tyson, he has this freestyle through the pandemic uh, every Saturday. It was a really fucking quality session and he has his own digital uh, campfire that he has a few sessions that he's uh, uh, stewarding. And then the idea is how to wisely market to bring more people in to find out about it without sort of, uh, you know, I guess attracting the wrong people or marketing in the wrong way where you're maybe marketing it out of the ego or game A purposes. Why do you need to, why do you need to market it? Okay. Well then this might be a way to um, add into the question is being in right relationship with the, uh, like reliance on receiving gifts. And um, yeah, so maybe like if there was ever a time for you, Andrew, where you found yourself in feeling a sense of need for a gift for like your security or well being or health, uh, maybe that situation has happened, maybe not. Um, how did you approach? Like maybe making your offering more widely available or more findable, found more, more awareness so that you might then attract more people to um, philosophize with so then that you might receive more gifts and take better care of your needs. Um, and so for me, I guess I just have, I, I notice these like hesitations or this caution about marketing and like spreading something. And because of the part of me that is like, wants the gifts that are going to come from doing that. Well, um, you just have to investigate. I mean, I hate to, 
to make it sound very spiritual, but you have to investigate what you just said there. I, I mean, I've never really marketed. I've just, you know, if I may speak in something like a Sufi, I'd say I, I do the best at philosophizing and let God take care of the rest. You, know, you can put that in stoical terms if you want to. You know, I see what's within my powers and I let the rest of it, less of it's a morfati. That's, so, you know, you know, it's, it, it seems like an undramatic answer, but you have to kind of investigate that feeling of need, the feeling of want, the contraction. Because if, you know, uh, you know the, the, the trust comes in the following manner. If, if this is a beautiful thing, it's a truly beautiful thing, then people will find it. Yeah, that's, that's where my intuition sits as well. Uh, let's do Tom, uh, last question, uh, and then we'll close up. Thanks. Yeah, um, to be sort of pragmatic, I think what Tyson and Peter are getting at is different than what you're doing, Andrew, and maybe what Ron is doing. Because I think Ron and Andrew, I, I believe, are working one-on-one -on -one with individuals and then sort of negotiating or going through a series of questions of what can you gift me or give me. Whereas Peter's got, you know, a bunch of us collected here. Tyson, it sounds like you also are collecting people, you know, like a group. So my question is, and to throw in an opinion quickly to Raj, I'm a little worried that there's too much re reliance on getting people's ego into having a score about what they're giving, which is kind of the market economy of, especially nonprofits and rich people who love just everybody to know how great they are. Um, anyways, there's a, there's a, the question for me is, maybe this can help Peter and Tyson. Andrew, how would you help them? Besides what I assume is they'd have to ask me individually, how would you help them increase those of us who may want to give something to them, but we need to be asked. Uh, okay, so I have, I have a couple of things. The, 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 so I like, I think you got this, Tom, I like fine, fine grained, well tuned um, responses. So the first thing we said occurred earlier, which is that on the website, I would make the what you might call the ask much clearer, much, much clearer. What does it? What what does what does Peter say really need? And so he has to know himself much better than is presented so far. And another thing he could do, if if, if he wanted to, um, the, the other thing that I, I I always do, and this is not because it's an obligation, is that whenever someone gives a gift, I will write write back to that person. That's it. the person wants to know that I received the gift and received it well, and I want to know something about the person. So that's a way of developing a relationship with that person. And that's something that Peter and, and Tyson could do. The third, thing could, the third thing that could be really interesting is if some people want to, as people will say today, be vulnerable, then they could actually say, look, um, Peter, do you want to have a conversation? And I can offer, we can talk about what would be a reasonable gift for you to offer, for me to offer you. You could do some of those sessions that would give him a sense of what people are, how their people are thinking. This is not market research. It's just a way of understanding what people are actually thinking. And it's a way for him to actually learn, uh, to learn to be much more comfortable around money. I've been doing something like that for 10 years. And it, it's actually a spiritual practice of learning what it's like to listen very openly, very non-judgmentally to what someone is saying to the point at which that person feels is if he or she can give wholeheartedly, whatever it is, and not in reference to what someone else would give or might give, or not in reference to what that person would like to give. Um, in other words, I don't, I don't necessarily, see, if one wants to be very intimate about this, I don't see a way around uh, the need to actually have some correspondences with people. Gift economy is a very messy, in my experience of gift economy is that it's very touchy. It's, it's very tactile. There's a lot of touching that goes on. You know, Winnicott would say there's a lot of holding, there's a lot of holding and touching. So that's, a, a, that's the kind of the, the pithy response is that find a way to have lots of holds and touches. Very cool. So uh, for my commitment, I, I will continue learning out loud uh, with this project in front of you all. Uh, and, and Brother Andrew will, will be along for the ride, I imagine. <laughs> um, so that being said, Andrew, thanks so much. Uh, 
for coming today and, and sharing your thoughts and engaging with us. Um, any any uh, closing thoughts on your end? No, just thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed meeting a lot of you today. It's be wonderful to see you again sometime. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank everyone uh, for coming out today. Um, I'm, I'm really gun shy talking about the gift economy right now. So <laughs> and I'll let myself uh, collect my, my thoughts and just share this link uh, in the time being in the chat box. And uh, I'll mention briefly for the upcoming events um, for today. Yeah, we just have one this afternoon at 6 p.m. Eastern time, a Shane Breakthrough Bootcamp with AJ Bond. Uh, he's a shame educator here in Toronto. Uh, he does these wonderful sessions about how to like build a relationship with shame individually and collectively. So check that out on the, the website. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Be well. Okay. Take care. I like how Andrew closes it. <laughs>